we um, are here to discuss a recent report that RMI released called the Economics of Commercial Building Electrification, particularly looking at rooftop packaged units. So uh, real quick, RMI, if you're not familiar with the work we do, uh, we're working to transform global energy to create a clean, prosper prosperous, and secure low, low carbon future for all. And what are we here today? Okay, so this report, uh, we set out to understand electrification opportunities in the commercial sector. We were particularly interested in identifying scalable and economically viable paths for electrifying buildings in the commercial sector. And uh, spoiler alert, <laughs> We did find through this body of work, viable and cost-effective retrofit packages in all four different geographies that we studied. And that's what we're gonna spend our time talking and discussing today. So real quick, um, I am Lacey Tan, and I am your facilitator for today's webinar. I am joined by the co-authors of this report, Anish Talik and Mohamed Faladazeh. And we are part of RMI's Carbon Free Buildings Program. All right, so here's our agenda before we get started. Just to get key takeaways, we'll discuss some of the high level key takeaways. We'll kind of go through the methodology and assumptions, very high level. And we'll pause real quick just for any quick feedback on that or clarifying questions. And then we'll review the city specific summaries and their results. We'll have a few policy recommendations. And then we've reserved a, a, a good block at the end of this 15 minutes for a Q&A. So just a few housekeeping items, all attendees are muted. So there will be no live questions. If you have a question, please submit them into the Q&A feature on Zoom. We will not be taking any questions via chat. So make sure they're in, Q in the Q&A feature. Um, we will be sharing the slides after the webinar. We'll also be um, we're sharing the recording of the webinar. I'm not sure if it'll be on our website or if we'll email it to attendees. And any questions that we don't get to, we will do our best to answer as a follow-up. Okay, so key takeaway number one. So what we found from this study, in every city that we studied, we found at least one all-electric retrofit package that was more cost-effective on a life cycle basis than a gas swap out or replacement. Additionally, we also found that when we package electrification of space heating with energy efficiency, demand management, and on-site PV, the economics improve. So that's pretty exciting. All right, so now that we've sort of oriented ourselves to what we're about to hear, I'm gonna pass it over to my colleague, Anish, who's gonna talk about the context, why we chose this sector and the geographies. Anish? Thanks, Lacey, and welcome everybody. We're really excited to have you here today to share our results. Um, so first I'd like to set some context about why we chose uh, the commercial sector. There's a lot of momentum in the residential sector to accelerate electrification of existing buildings. And we identified a gap in the commercial market and really acknowledging that commercial buildings are about half of total emissions from the building sector. And in total 16% of US energy related carbon emissions. So this is a really important uh, task for us to undertake uh, in the next 10 years is how do we uh, eliminate uh, use of fossil fuels in our commercial building stock. But the commercial building stock is very heterogeneous. So in the residential market, there are similar solutions that could be replicated uh, very efficiently across the market, but in the commercial sector, a huge challenge is that there's many different commercial building types. There's retail buildings, there's school and academic buildings, there's office buildings. So what we try to do is narrow the scope of our analysis to focus on a specific heating system typology that we believe 
is replicable and is ubiquitous in the commercial market. And as you can see on this slide, uh, packaged heating units account for uh, the, uh, a significant uh, percentage of floor space in the commercial market. And so this is why we chose packaged heating units as the system type to study in, in this analysis and more specifically looking at the commercial office market um, for the, the first um, uh, analysis. We also wanted to strive for geograph geographic diversity in the scope of our study. So we studied four different geographies uh, covering different climates, uh, different gas and electricity rate conditions, and so you can see the list of uh, sample cities here. We looked at Washington DC and Chicago, which have uh, cold winter climates. Seattle, which has uh, a, a more temperate winter climate, but still cold. And Las Vegas, which is our mild climate uh, typology for this, for this study. I'll pass it over to Mohammed to speak a bit about the uh, mechanical system design. So we're gonna dive a little bit into the weeds on the technical aspects and assumptions for the report for the next few minutes. Thanks Anish um, and hello everyone and welcome. Um, so the baseline system, as we just uh, discussed right now, uh, for existing systems um, that we are looking into our building, we are using natural gas fire package RTU for space heating and natural gas domestic hot water heater for domestic hot water. Our proposed system for the all electric building that we are looking into is to use heat pump RTU, heat pump rooftop units, which is basically air source heat pump for space heating and air source heat pump water heater for domestic hot water. So on the right hand side here, uh, we are seeing the schematics of a rooftop unit. Uh, it's basically similar to air handling units that we have on commercial buildings uh, with the distinction that the heat pump system, mainly uh, the compressor, evaporator, expansion valve, and every component is just located in one unit and we have everything as a package unit. The heat wheel that we have here, is not a mandatory part of every rooftop unit, but it's one of the um, efficiency measures that can be applied in order to extract the heat from the living air. Next slide, please. We have looked into uh, six model cases or packages here. Um, the first case um, or package that we have here is basically no electrification looking into a conventional gas-fired RTU. In our case two, we are looking into partial electrification. So we have heat pump RTU, which is providing space heating, but it also has a gas backup. Case three is full electrification. Everything is fully electrified and there is no gas usage in the building. Case four case, takes case three, and adds ERV, which is energy recovery ventilation unit, and efficiency measures to that. Case five is efficient electrification and demand management. So basically we have heat pump RTU with electric resistance backup, plus ERV, plus peak demand management and efficiency measures applied to our case. Some of the geographies that we have looked into, uh, there's a significant amount of solar radiation. So we have looked into case six, which is basically case five, plus the solar rooftop added to our system. And we are comparing all these cases uh, in terms of their um, economic considerations. So let's look into the energy recovery ventilation unit. As I mentioned, it's not a mandatory part of every RTU, but here for the efficiency measures, we are using an ERV, which is basically a heat exchanger. So we have incoming unconditioned air and incoming conditioned stale air that's coming from the indoor uh, environments. So incoming unconditioned fresh outdoor air is gonna grab the heat from the stale air that's coming from the indoor environment 
And it's going to be preconditioned as it leaves the heat exchanger or the ERV system. So basically, uh, we are using part of the heat that's going to be otherwise lost to the outdoor environment. So it's basically the structure of an ERV unit. And that's one of the efficiency measures that we have applied uh, in our building. Next slide, please. For the technical assumptions, we are using a DOE prototypical building for medium-sized commercial office buildings. So on the right-hand side, uh, we have the schematic of the building and the thermal zones are identified in this building. Uh, our building is around 54,000 square feet and it's using 1980s envelope. It's three-story building with a window to bar ratio of 33%. For the analysis, we are using Open Studio with its Engine Energy Plus for energy modeling and LBNL's window for the envelope considerations. For the renewable energy systems modeling, we have used NRL System Advisor model for renewable energy systems modeling. And at this point, I'll pass it over to Lacey for any questions. Thank you, Mohammed and Anish. So real quick, before we move on to the results and kind of look at the cities and the, and the specific packages, we just wanted to pause to see if there were any questions regarding the modeling assumptions and what, you know, what went into these models. So feel free if there's anybody has any questions, I'll give a minute here or two to type it in. We do have one that said, is this a 1980s envelope with no improvement? I assume you're asking about the baseline. Anish? Sure, so this is our baseline model. It is a 1980s envelope with no improvements. In our analysis, we did test envelope upgrades to this building. Um, in Mohammed's presentation of the different cases, you didn't see that envelope efficiency measure included and that's because it was not a, a very cost-effective upgrade. And uh, so we focused in our uh, final report on the uh, results that were more beneficial. And since it's 1980s envelope, there uh, was a, a good amount of, of thermal performance from that envelope already. And then Thomas had a question about the source of cost data. Yes, so our cost data is uh, coming from RS means, um, which folks are likely familiar with, it's uh, the kind of basic uh, basis for many cost estimations done in the construction industry. Um, we supplemented that with um, outreach to specific vendors for some of the heat pump products. So just to make sure that our assumptions were, the RS means assumptions were in line since uh, heat pumps are an emerging technology. And we did account for inflation and uh, geographic variation. Um, so it's not one standard cost assumption. Uh, it accounts for regional var variability in labor rates and things like that. Um, Mohammed, there's a question. Is there lighting auxiliary HVAC equipment in the baseline model for interactive effects? So are we modeling those aspects? I believe we are, but Mohammed, I don't know if you have anything to add. Um, we are we are looking into like um, we looked into different cases, but as Anish mentioned, uh, it's not like a cost-effective scenario here. So we didn't look into like uh, we are not presenting basically those here. Thanks. And then mm -hmm. we have a question: Did you get costs from installers as well? So the outreach that I mentioned was to vendors. So they're sort of the wholesale suppliers of HVAC equipment. Um, and so the installer cost or the labor cost, et cetera, th that was primarily coming from, from RS Means. I think we can take one more niche and then maybe move on. We've got one last one here. I think uh, Thomas wants to know what the assumed performance of the heat pump. That, that is a really good question, um, which we would be happy to have a follow-up discussion about uh, those aspects of the study because they're uh, quite detailed to go into right now, um, but we can definitely follow up. We used um, 
uh, specific products for our performance curves. All right, so I can move us forward into our presentation of the results of the study. So at a high level, this is our summary for the net present value over 20 years for uh, all cases in all cities. So don't get too bogged down in all of the, the information here. The main, the main takeaway is that what we're, what we're looking at, or looking for rather, is a positive payback. So over 20 years, we want to return that first cost through energy cost savings, um, and so you can see that for each of the geographies SLAC touched on up top, there is a case or multiple cases for electrifying uh, efficiently and economically. Um, and there are some nuances to how the different cases perform in different geographies, uh, but the high level takeaway here is that uh, there is a, an economically positive case for electrification in all cities. So let's start with Chicago to start unpacking our results. So the results for Chicago showed that the most economical package was full electrification with the ERV, the ventilation efficiency measure, and the peak demand management configuration. So briefly looking at annual energy use and cost, uh, just side by side, you can see case one, which is the counterfactual where you are just replacing with like equipment. Uh, you can see the distribution of gas uh, use and electricity use. And on the right, you can see electricity cost and gas cost. So take away, I think we all, we all know this gas is cheaper per unit of energy than electricity. And that is one of our major challenges with uh, pursuing electrification. You can see in case two, which is our partial electrification case, that we are reducing the amount of gas that is being used in the, the building. We're just using it during the peak conditions. Uh, but because we're using electricity for heating, that increases our electricity use in case two. And you can see case three, which is our just like base electrification case, no ERV, that that causes an increase in annual, annual total utility costs. And so a major focus of our analysis was to find an economical way to pursue that electrification. And you can see in case four, which is the efficient electrification case with the ERV, that you use the efficiency to um, provide cost savings along with energy savings. And case five provides additional savings with demand management. And we did include a, a case with renewable energy as well. So looking at the economic results, more specifically for Chicago, you can see that the partial electrification case, case two does have a positive uh, net present value. Case three, the inefficient electrification case does not, so that's not recommended. Um, and that makes sense. We wouldn't want to um, use, uh, rely on the electric resistance backup for too much time in Chicago because it is a very cold climate. So the efficient electrification case where we are combining demand management and the ERV is the, the beneficial electrification case for Chicago. We also want to demonstrate what the greenhouse gas emissions benefit of all of this is. Uh, we're going to provide the summary just for Chicago, but the full results for all cities is in our report. Um, but we, we understand why we're pursuing, just we all understand why we're pursuing electrification. So you can see here, uh, this is with grid emissions for electricity uh, use today in maroon and gas in yellow. And you can see what the uh, percentage of emissions of gas versus of electricity use in the uh, Chicago uh, building is, and then how that changes with the different conditions. 
But more importantly, we want to project forward to the future. What does the grid look like in 2050? It's a lot cleaner. And so when we have uh, a, a clean, clean grid, if you look at case one, which is our counterfactual, the gas rooftop unit, if it's still in place, would account for uh, slightly more than half of the emissions uh, from the building. And so it is critical to eliminate that end use so we can uh, achieve full electrification and uh, zero carbon. I will point out, and we've gotten questions about why is there still a gray, why, what is happening with that gray bar? Why is there still uh, carbon emissions in 2050? We're using um, marginal emissions data, which is the marginal plant that is producing uh, electricity for the grid. And given the assumptions of our analysis, which is um, the NREL Cambium data, which is sort of the most latest uh, um, emissions coefficients uh, out there, they, they still include um, an, a certain amount of, of fossil fuels as a marginal emitter in 2050. And finally on Chicago, I did want to point out the winter peak uh, load mitigation measure and the real benefits of doing that and why we pursued it. Uh, this is a huge question uh, for folks talking about electrification in cold climates. Is this going to break the grid? Are we just going to increase electricity use during the worst possible cold periods um, because we're relying on electric resistance? And so um, we do want to demonstrate that and be very honest about it. So looking at case one, which is this dark blue line, that's our baseline. So that's what we're comparing everything against. Um, and I'll point out case three, which is that full electrification without efficiency case. And you can see that under the cold, uh, coldest day, and, and this is looking at the coldest day in our, um, in our climate file, that uh, the peak electricity use spikes considerably. And that is um, quite scary and could at scale um, cause issues for the grid. So we wanna mitigate that. And so with case four, which is the ERV in green, you can see that reduces the peak condition considerably, but doesn't quite get us down to uh, what the counterfactual you know, gas baseline is, um, which is where uh, case five comes in, which is our, our peak demand management case. And that is just really looking at uh, set point management um, uh, to, to mitigate the peak condition, which in this instance was a, a morning warm up period where you're bringing uh, the whole building to its daytime set point temperature um, for heating. And that, that ramp in the morning just caused the huge peak. So in our demand management um, scenario, we just uh, don't set back the temperature at night as much. So we're using a little bit more energy overnight, but we're preventing the building from uh, the, that huge peak ramp up period in the morning. So just a little bit of uh, kind of what's behind this, uh, this peak uh, management case. And you can see the real benefits of that. Um, I'll go through Seattle next. Um, so in Seattle, the in contrast to Chicago, it does have a more temperate winter uh, climate. And in this instance, a standalone one-to-one -one replacement uh, of a gas rooftop unit with the heat pump product was cost-effective. Uh, and that was, that's an interesting result. Um, I won't walk through this in detail. I think that, that we all understand that this, this similar themes hold true that gas is cheaper per unit than electricity and that pose a challenge. But you can see that if we look at case four and five, which are those efficient electrification cases, that they don't provide a significant energy use benefit or energy cost benefit. And that's because e the ERV is really effective in cold climates where you get more out of the heat recovery uh, system. And as a result of that, uh, you can see with our net present value results that those efficiency upgrades, um, again, just to, the, just to the ventilation system, we're not, not talking about other efficiency, and this is just one prototypical building, 
those efficiency upgrades did not pay back in, in Seattle. And that case three, which is full electrification with a standard roof, uh, 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 heat pump rooftop unit uh, was cost neutral or, or paid back uh, slightly. And I'll pass it to Mohammed to go into our results for Las Vegas. Thanks, Anish. Uh, so next we'll look into Las Vegas. Um, basically in Las Vegas, we have uh, temperate winter climates similar uh, to Seattle that we just talked about. Um, and Las Vegas is a cooling dominated area. Uh, here we'll see that the cost effective package is basically an all in decarbonization package, looking into mainly case six, uh, having everything for the energy efficiency, electrification, peak demand management, plus having the rooftop solar installed in our building. So if you look into the annual energy use and uh, annual utility charges here, um, so for case one, which is basically our counterfactual case, 8% um, of the energy use is coming from the gas. But if you look into the side, chart here, which is the uh, annual utility charges, um, gas is responsible for around 3% of total charges because of the rate structure that we have. However, as we are moving into case three, which is full electrification, uh, full electrification is increasing um, our electricity use, but overall decreasing our energy use uh, if we compare it with case one, so case three and case one. An overall trend is reducing, but as we just pointed out for Seattle, case four and case five, which is basically efficient electrification and efficient electrification and demand management doesn't show significant benefits compared to our counterfactual case because uh, ERV system and the peak demand management strategy that we are using uh, really pays back if you're looking into um, cold clients. If you look into the net present value analysis, so all the cases here, uh, case two, partial electrification, looking into full electrification, we can see that as we are adding components, basically energy efficiency components and peak demand management, we can see uh, that it doesn't pay back economically until case six, which is the rooftop solar. And that's because of the significant amount of solar radiation that we have in Las Vegas. And that pays back the full electrification plus the efficiency measures that we have applied here. And the worst case that, that we have here is case five, but as we add case six, which the difference was just the rooftop solar, we can see that we are gonna get efficient and economically viable electrification as we are implementing rooftop solar. Next slide, please. So for Washington DC, we still have, we have another um, cold climate uh, environment. And here the cost effective package is an all, elect, all in decarbonization package, which combines electrification with efficiency upgrades, peak demand management and rooftop solar. Uh, if we look into the annual utility charges and also consumption uh, in the next slide, uh, we'll see that gas accounts for 15%, significant portion of the annual, annual energy consumption. But because of the rate structure that we have, it's only responsible for around 3% of annual charges. As we are fully electrifying our building, case three, Electric consumption is gonna increase, but at the same time, the total energy consumption is gonna decrease for our case tree. And the best performance here in terms of energy and utility charges is for case six, uh, in which we have the lowest amount of energy consumption and annual charges for uh, the case that we have efficient electrification applied to uh, fully electric building, demand management, and rooftop solar. For the net present value here, uh, we'll be looking into two rate structures. First, we will look into the recent rate structures, which is the 2021-2022 rates, uh, year-to-day rates. 
uh, we can see that since it's cold climate here, uh, adding the ERV uh, at case four and then peak demand management uh, makes our case to perform much better compared to only full electrification, which is case three. But still, it's not a positive value. And the positive value is achieved when we are looking into K6, which is adding the rooftop solar here. So this is for the recent rates that we have for Washington, D.C. But we just wanted to see and look into the sensitivity of our rates here and um, see how the rates are going to change as the gas prices are changing. So if you look into the next slide, and uh, we have the 2019 rates, we can see that the 2021 rates, which is the increased gas rate structure, is performing much better in terms of economic uh, metrics that we have. So for example, K6, 6,200 positive year for 2021, 2022 rates, but for uh, the next slide, it's only 1,800 positive. So we can see as the gas rate is increasing, our electrification and measures that we are applying is going to perform much better economically. So if you look into uh, the peak load mitigation, as we discussed about Chicago, uh, we have the concerns about electrification impacting the peak demand. But we can show here and we can observe that as we are moving from case one, which is the counterfactual case, and we have around 172 kilowatts electric as our peak demand, full electrification is increasing our peak demand. But as we are looking to case six, which is the case that we are recommending here, we've actually reduced the peak demand to 162 kilowatt, hour, kilowatt electric which is um, the case that we will be recommending here for um, Washington, D.C. So overall, case six, which is all decarbonization measures plus uh, rooftop solar is the case that we will be recommending for Washington, D.C. climates. With that, I'll pass it over to Lacey for um, policy recommendations. Great, thanks. Appreciate that. That was a lot of uh, really rich information. So hopefully we'll get some more questions here because we have some time. Um, so we have a few policy recommendations based on this analysis. And this is just really the start as we begin to think about it. But, you know, a, a big one is the market development for heat pump rooftop units. You know, if we get more installers, more products, more performance testing, we can really start to get them out on the market. And then we'd require some utility coordination, um, you know, to prove the operational economics for, for the electrification as we saw those peak demands and making sure we have demand management, um, as well as building performance standards. Um, you know, we, we need to really think about signals and levers that we can use to incentivize decarbonization, which would include fuel switching. So those are sort of our three top policy recommendations at this point, which we'll dive into more as we uh, continue the work on our economics of electrifying building series. And with that, um, we if there's anything else, we'd love to take some questions. Again, there's no live Q&A. It's just type your in your questions to the Q&A chat feature here on not the chat, the Q&A feature on Zoom. And uh, yeah, we'll get started. Uh, one question we had from Benny was, was a cold climate RTU used for the modeling? Yes, yeah, we used a, a cold climate RTU as the, the sample product and that's um, what our costing reflects. We understand that there are not um, established uh, performance specifications for cold climate RTUs, um, but we referenced um, specific products. Mohammed, anything to add there? No, um, yes, we have looked into uh, cold climate RTUs at um, different temperatures and different climates that we have looked into. Yeah. And, and uh, I have a question on that. Are, are, so are rooftop units, are these are, are heat pump rooftop units are pretty widely available on the market in general? And then, you know, how available are those cold climate rated ones? 
Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And it is one of the, the challenges um, of scaling this solution. Um, heat pump rooftop units are available on the market. They're primarily used right now in, I would say, Sunbelt cities uh, for retail uses and um, where there's you know temperate winter climates. But there have been recent advancements um, and releases of cold climate heat pump products. They're, I would say, in a pilot phase. Um, but they're, I would say, some of the major um, HVAC uh, vendors and manufacturers, rather, are uh, providing these cold climate heat pump products now. So Lennox, Daikin, AAON just had a released a statement that they have a, a cold climate heat pump RTU. So we see this as a, a solution that in the next you know, two to three years when there is solid performance testing um, and you know, specification on performance ratings that the solution will scale very quickly. Um, and that's why we wanna get in front of it and demonstrate what the economics are so people feel more comfortable about adopting it. Um, the last thing I'll say on that is that uh, Northeast Energy Efficiency Partnerships uh, is working on um, a cold climate specification for heat pump RTUs, which will, I think, give a lot of confidence to the market. Great. Thanks for that, Anish. Uh, we have a couple questions from Tom. Uh, Tom was would like to know if we reflected any in our gas uh, rates, gas or forecast for gas and electric rates. Did we think about what happens as um, folks start to leave the gas distribution? So as our gas sales volume declines and those rates begin to rise for those left on the, the grid, did, you, did we reflect that in our rates analysis? Go ahead, Ronan. Yeah, uh, sure. Um, so we, we have looked into the sensitivity for the gas prices, but specifically looking into the changes in gas volume and how it's going to affect the rates and doing like a rate analysis. No, that wasn't like um, one of the, uh, like the, on the scope of this project. Uh, but we have done sensitivity analysis on gas rates and how that would affect um, our analysis and the overall results. Uh, and for the next question, like looking into electrification with gas backup and ERV, uh, we have done the partial electrification only with gas backup, but we haven't added the ERV to that system um, and just looking into uh, the scenario here, because the main idea was to look into electrification and see if it's economically viable, efficiently viable for the climate that we are looking into. And um, that the answer to that one is like adding the ERV to gas backup that that's not uh, looked into in this study. What about IRA implementation? Um, do we expect that to impact the cost effectiveness of these rooftop unit and selection choices? You know, I should have a better response prepared for this one. Um, I think a lot of the IRA measures are focused on the residential market, but there are tranches of funding for commercial commercial building decarbonization. So um, the way that they're designed is primarily through incentive programs. So I think it's up to the market to decide which solutions they want to adopt. Um, so I don't know about any like supply side measures for rooftop units specifically. Um, but yeah, we can follow up with more information on that. It's a really good question. And I, I would just want to, I wanted to add something on the gas uh, escalation question about um, in potentially increasing rates um, as sales plummet. Um, we just, we used a typical gas escalation rate assumptions, uh, which are used for life cycle cost analysis um, by different portfolios, but this that's a conservative assumption, right? So if the theory is that gas rates are gonna increase, the economics that we presented here would only look better. Um, and that's just the economic th side of things. We obviously are not touching on the 
equity side of things about people being stranded on those systems. But just wanted to point out from an economic standpoint, we're being conservative with these assumptions. So that's a good point. It'd be interesting to see how that impacts over time. Uh, we have a question here uh, regarding HVAC technology, and um, this attendee wants to know, you know, with, with technology moving towards more air-cooled, water-cooled VRF and geothermal loops where possible, do we think these newer heat pump RTUs have high enough efficiency to compete with those simultaneous heating and cooling solutions? Um, so in order to look into that, uh, basically the idea here uh, was that we have gas fired uh, RTUs widely available in small to medium sized office buildings. And moving from gas fired to the heat pump RTUs is gonna be a light retrofit that we have for most of the existing commercial buildings. As we are looking into new technologies, such as like um, air-cooled, water-cooled, VRF, and geothermal loops, that's going to be a heavy retrofit that we have for our existing buildings. So once we are looking into a light retrofit, yes, but um, since the comparison is not being done here in this study, like looking into uh, different VRF systems and also uh, looking into heat pump RTUs and how they are going to perform in terms of their economic viabilities. And I'll, and I'll just say we initially tried to test that retrofit case um, using VRF because that is um, more well understood and applied in, in the commercial market. But the um, cost of those retrofits was significantly higher than what we're presenting here, which is this is a one in one to one replacement. Everything's packaged. Um, so we are trying to balance, you know, what the market's comfortable with and whether those are slightly more energy efficient than an air, all air system, but also the first cost and the real challenges of retrofitting an existing building. Okay, we've got a lot, another question here about battery storage and vehicle to grid. And did we look at any way to reduce the peak demand and the associated economic impacts to both building and potential avoided costs on the building or grid side? So I, yeah, I think we did not in terms of integration of these items, but that is an interesting point. I'll let Mohammed Anish, if you have any insights you wanna share. Um, not, not specifically. Um, we did try to, uh, well, we did not try, we modeled battery storage as one of our cases. So building off of the PV case, we did do a battery plus PV case. The economics didn't were you know, similar to the envelope retrofit that I described earlier, didn't uh, pencil and we chose not to include it in, in, in the results. Um, vehicle to grid, that is an emerging technology and has a lot of like, regulatory hurdles to make that happen. Um, but in general, I would say that uh, we have folks at RMI who are working on this idea of a virtual power plant or VPP and how but batteries, uh, vehicle to grid, just you know, modulating demands at the um, user level can be used to provide economic benefits to the grid and the user. So in the works, not in, in the scope of this study, but great, great idea. Do you think, Anish, that would be more applicable to like new commercial buildings or do we think that could work in existing? Um, I think it it could work in existing to make the economics look better. Um, acknowledging that they're, I mean, actually it might be a, a very valuable solution in an existing building because it could prevent you from having to upgrade your electrical panel or electrical mm transformer and, and uh, capacity at the site, if that's a limitation, um, peak demand management and batteries are a way to um, mitigate that. So it could actually bring your first cost down. So, yeah. Mm, yeah. Um, and we have one last question here, but keep coming in, we still have a few more minutes. So um, are RTUs considered a packaged terminal heat pump? Are those different? Those are different. Um, packaged terminal heat pumps are what are, are work similar to like a, a window AC or something like that. It's installed 
on the building in the zone, in the zone that you're trying to heat and cool. Um, the rooftop unit is still a central piece of equipment that you have on your rooftop and the heating and cooling is happening and then it's being, the air is being delivered to the zones separately. So that's the difference there. Okay, um, I have one last question in case no one else does. I'm curious, what, what are some critical next steps to advancing um, you know, these solutions in the market? Yeah, I, I mean, I think the policy slide that we just took down actually covers that pretty well. I would say the primary um, lever I think that needs to be pulled soon is just market development for these products. So the consumer and installer confidence piece, I think people are still concerned for cold climates, whether heat pump rooftop units will perform um, and pr provide comparable performance to the gas alternative. So there was a suggestion about, can we do heat pump RTUs with gas backup um, and ERV? Like that is probably what uh, building owners wanna do because that would make them feel really safe. So as soon as we can get as much information about all electric heat pump RTUs um, and performance ratings and, and tests for them, that's, that's the critical critical path to get them scaled. Yeah. Um, looks like we have one last question here. Let's see. Yeah, so um, wondering if the RTUs modeled a constant volume or were there any models with the downstream VAVs, FPVs, maybe we explain what those are. Uh, Mohammed, do you wanna take that one? Sure. Um, so we don't have uh, like models with downstream VAVs here. Uh, we have looked into the reheat and how it's going to impact at the downstream level, uh, the zone, zone delivery level, uh, but we don't have downstream VAVs and how that's going to impact our system. Um, it's more of like constant volume system at the um, rooftop unit. Yes, yeah, to clarify that this is a system that has VAVs at the zone level, um, but our VAV terminals at the zone level, but our goal was to keep those in situ and not change them too much. So uh, we have some like fan efficiency included as part of the ERV upgrade, but there's not a lot of cost going into zone level ter VAV terminal upgrades. What about RTUs overseas? Do we have any examples of these being used in other countries that are maybe a little more advanced, moved a little more forward in electrification and heat pumps? That is a, a great question. Um, I would need to look into that in more detail. My hunch is that the US has the largest RTU market. Um, and so we would be the ones who would lead this RTU electrification um, and create the demand for it for the HVAC providers. Because if we look at Europe, um, which is a more advanced market um, for some of these products, a lot of their system, systems are hydronic um, already. They've been hydronic for many years. They're not air systems. Okay, um, let's see. I think we have a really technical question here from Tom. I'm not sure if we wanna take this or just maybe follow up. Um, so I think for this one, um, if we just direct like the uh, building exhaust or the outdoor heat pump coil, um, we are like doing part of that using the energy recovery. So basically the heat wheel that we talked about, that's taking advantage of the heat that's gonna be otherwise lost. But um, at the entrance level for the fresh air, uh, because of the ventilation requirements, we are not gonna be able to just provide it because there's gonna be a shortcut and that air is just gonna go back to the building level. Um, so uh, the answer uh, to that would be no, just because of like the fresh air and the ventilation requirements. 
helpful. Uh, Cindy Jacobs has a question here about incremental electrification and how we talked about it in terms of systems, but she's curious to know about terms of sections of buildings, such as floor by floor. So the RTUs that we are implementing here, we have, it was a three-story building with three RTUs, each of them supplying one floor of the building, one story of the building. Um, so we could look into uh, floor by floor electrification, if I'm understanding the question correctly, uh, but we have looked into the whole system, like the entire building and the full electrification, um, because uh, we have seen like for residential buildings, uh, if we remove the gas infrastructure, that could also provide some additional economic benefits and environmental benefits. So uh, the whole idea was to look into the full electrification, but we can definitely look into uh, floor by floor um, or different sections of buildings electrification. Okay, well, we only have a few minutes remaining. So um, just a reminder, we will share the slides and we'll also share this recording with the questions and answers. Um, if you would like to reach out and you have any more questions, particularly on some of the technical stuff and the modeling assumptions, uh, please reach out to us. We're happy to answer some follow-up questions. Um, I think we had a slide with some contact, Anish. I don't know if you want to just throw that up there real quick, but. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just add if, if there are folks uh, listening in who are working on pilot projects or with clients who are trying to install this type of system or even working with um, testing for uh, cold climate heat, uh, rooftop units, um, please get in touch. We'd be happy to hear about that and learn more about where, where things are. Okay. And with that, we will bid you all a good day and appreciate your time and take care. Thanks everyone. Thanks, everyone.